They are Russia's ultimate warriors. Cold-hearted, ruthless, and forged out of the most brutal training regime ever created. They can take more punishment and more pain than you can possibly dish out. When Mother Russia calls, this elite fighting force takes on any challenge and leaves a trail of death and destruction. You develop a man into a weapon. Everything else is a tool. Weaponology travels back into the wild heart of the men who through blood, guts, and bullets earned their nickname, Russia's Pit Bulls. They are Spetsnaz. It's time to go ballistic. Killing for the Kremlin is their deadly game. Spetsnaz is their name. The Russian phrase is Vyska Spetsyanova Naznachenia, which literally translates to special purpose forces. They're part of the army, they're part of the security services, and they're part of the interior ministry as well. And they are used for a whole variety of different roles. Okay. Spetsnaz's specialist strike squads took out the terrorists during the Beslan school siege. During the war in Afghanistan and the bloody battles in Chechnya, this vast army of elite units paved the way into enemy territory. The reputation of Spesnas is one of being very political, highly ruthless, able to dispatch the enemies of the Kremlin uh, no matter where they are. Сам Спецназ высший уровень, он может работать практически везде, практически во всех во всех отраслях, скажем так, войны. Вот это боец, который знает практически все. Their ruthlessness, their willingness to die to accomplish a mission, this makes the Spetsnaz feared. When the Soviet Union disintegrated in the early 90s, the new Russian Federation became a target for terrorists. Spetsnaz stepped up to the mark, tackling this deadly new enemy head on. Since the end of the Cold War, the Russian Federation started recognizing the need for special operations counter-terror units. They do get called frequently into terrorist and certainly mass hostage sieges that, that Russia has been experiencing in recent years. In these high-risk, high-pressure situations, Russia's premier strike force is armed with hardware that is rugged, reliable, and undeniably a product of its Soviet heyday. The Spetsnaz soldier is a die-hard fighting machine. For taking the men out at a distance, he's armed with the silent but deadly Ventores sniper rifle. And if the enemy ever closes in, they can get down and dirty with the most famous gun in history the AK-47. But when push comes to shovel, the Spetsnaz use their standard issue Sapirka to drop the bad guy. This fine tradition of deadly close quarters combat and lethal handheld weaponry ramp up the fear factor of the Spetsnaz. Now, weaponology will go back through generations of technology to unlock their family tree. The men, the machines, the moments that shaped the history of this elite fighting unit. Rewind to the 1980s. If the Cold War ever went hot, 30,000 elite troops, organized into Spetsnaz sabotage squads, would add fuel to the flames. They would be the people who would go deep, who would try to take out headquarters, who would try to paralyze airfields and communication nodes, and that sort of thing. The Spetsnaz were trained to bring NATO to its knees. I think that during the Cold War, the fact that not that much was known about the Spetsnaz did kind of make them more boogeymen in, in the eyes of Western military and intelligence services. In 1936, the forerunners of Spetsnaz began the modern tradition of Soviet special forces during the Spanish Civil War. Spetsnaz brigades trained the soldiers of the new Spanish Republic to fight against General Franco's fascist armies. 
They conducted a lot of long-range recon intelligence. Ambushes and that type of thing were, were very, very common, and they definitely proved their mettle. When World War II began, small groups of elite Russian troops would infiltrate German lines on the Eastern Front and create havoc. They were the predecessors to the Spetsnaz. They played very important parts in information gathering behind enemy lines. They were a quite effective tool in World War II. Those people certainly fought in the most horrible conditions imaginable and still managed to survive, still managed to prevail, uh, still managed to ensure victory. In the bloody battlefields of the Eastern Front, rugged and reliable weaponry was needed. Soviet weaponologists delivered. A lot of Russian weapon design reflected the fact that the Russian army was a big army. Uh, taking into its ranks soldiers who, by and large, were not terribly well-educated and would be quite hard to train on sophisticated weapons. And it did a very good line on robust and soldier-proof weapons. Step forward the potent PPSH, or Papa Shah. This is the uh, Soviet PPSH, and as some machine guns go, this is a very good submachine gun. It's very crude. It's stamped. There's nothing exotic about this at all. And because it's stamped out, the tolerances in this machine gun are very loose. So you can abuse this, and um, Russian troops did. Weighing in at less than nine pounds and firing over a staggering 900 rounds per minute, the Papa Shah was a short range shoot 'em down. This is gonna work when it is 60 below zero and it's gonna work after being in mud and dirt and filth and not being taken care of. It's just going to work. As World War II neared its end, the Soviets recognized the need for a more accurate, rapid firing Reaper to replace the Papa Shah. This daddy of battlefield reliability became the hub of the Spetsnaz family tree and forms the blueprint for most of Russia's deadly arsenal over the next 60 years. It would become the most famous gun in history, the Kalashnikov AK-47. The AK-47 is one of the biggest success stories in the whole of weapons technology. And it's good because it's soldier-proof. It doesn't let you down. It does what it does in a robust and simple way. I can't think of a rifle which has had a greater impact on world history than the AK-47. The AK series of assault rifles and Spetsnaz. A deadly partnership forged from absolute reliance on each other in the cauldron of combat. Your AK uh, is your mother, your wife, your lover, and your child. You were taught to, to live with it. You slept with it, you ate with it, and when I say to live with it, it's 24-7. Smack the arm, take it out here. Sonny Puzikash should know better than most. He served as a Spetsnaz operative for over three years. Even during his brutal training program, he learned to depend upon his AK for support. Basically, when we did our exercises, everything was based around the weapon. So you put the weapon on its magazine and you do your push-ups on the weapon. All your weight, all your body weight is resting on nothing more than the magazine lock. Okay? And you're just doing push-ups on that weapon. Most, most other designs would not be able to survive this. And the way this Every part of Kalashnikov's assault rifles were utilized by Spetsnaz, even the weapon sling. At that point, you would use the sling to gain control over his head, and you can use that person as a cover when you're engaging your targets. In the hands of Spetsnaz, the AK-47 will become a rapid-fire reaper. It was a marriage made in hell, till death do us part. A lot of people died with this weapon in their hands before they dropped it and tried to run away transitioning to other weapon. This was something that will save you. And a lot of times it did. The AK boasts a simple design that ensures that every time the trigger is pulled, it's followed by a bang. 
but it has a lot of gas pressure to cycle the action, so it has a lot of force to work its way through debris and grime. Also, the tolerances inside the gun are very loose. So if there's a lot of debris inside the weapon, generally it does not affect functioning. Okay, we're gonna do a little full auto fire. Blood, guts, and dirt are the enemy of the internal workings of any gun. Can Kalashnikov's killer continue to get deadly with a gut full of grime? The myth out there is that this gun will shoot with a pound of dirt in it. It will not fire with pounds of dirt in it. It will fire with mud in it, snow, water. It'll still fire. We're going to put a little dirt in it. OK? And we're going to test it and see if this weapon shoots. When Russia's Red Army roars, Spetsnaz are their lethal spearhead. The cornerstone of their firepower, the Kalashnikov AK-47. This mass-produced legend became the granddaddy of the AK series of assault rifles. A firm favorite with all Russian special operations units. Any areas where it's going to be hard on men, it's also going to be real hard on equipment. So a weapon like this uh, that can take a phenomenal amount of abuse and continue to work uh, is a big attribute. I've seen weapons that have been in the field for three, four months straight without one cleaning and function to the extent of five, six loaded magazines on full order one after another to the point where wooden hand guards would start smoking from the heat. Regarded as basic by today's standards, at the time of its genesis, it was a weapon that was way ahead of its time. Developed by Russian tank sergeant Mikhail Kalashnikov in 1947, here was a weapon that would soon become a legend. Kalashnikov had looked at some German technology and produced this robust, fully automatic infantry assault rifle, which not only equipped the Russian army, but then went on to equip insurgents across most of the world. The idea of an assault rifle was revolutionary and would shape the face of the global battlefield. Just three years earlier, the German Sturmgewehr had unleashed a tsunami of lead against the Allies during World War II. This particular weapon is the granddaddy of the AK and the M16 and all the assault rifles that are in service around the world. In my opinion, the most significant small arm fielded in the 20th century. Kalashnikov's take on the Sturmgewehr would take the high rate of fire of submachine guns like the Papa Shah and combine it with a more accurate bullet similar to that used by rifles like the Mosin Nagant. His genius, a weapon that over 60 years later still remains beloved by Mother Russia's best soldiers. If I met Mikhail Kalashnikov, uh, I would definitely buy him a number of shots of vodka for the design that he put together and for the reliability that we, we come to expect and for the most part always received from his design. From the caves of Afghanistan and the urban combat around Grozny and Chechnya, Spetsnaz choose to get locked and loaded with their Kalashnikovs. Generally speaking, you pull the trigger, if this thing's loaded, it's gonna run for you. Firing 600 rounds per minute and effective to 300 yards, the AK-47 performs no matter how much blood and guts there is on the battlefield. I uh, heard a story from an ex-Green Beret. Him and his team stumbled across a dead body that decomposed into an AK that was under him. And the person must have been there for weeks, maybe a month or two. When they turned the body over and discovered the AK, all the innards and everything just went through the weapon. And he picked up the weapon, chambered around, and the weapon fired perfectly. But sometimes even the AK has the bare-faced cheek to run out of ammunition. Yep, I got more ammunition, so... 
Not a problem for a Spetsnaz operative who is trained to keep the AK's deadly barrel pointing towards the enemy, even when it's running on empty. This being AK, being very reliable weapon, if you do have a situation where it goes click instead of bang, you can obviously right away go into changing the magazine and continuing from there. Unfortunately, very often in the battle, you're not gonna have the luxury of doing the tactical reload quickly because you're in the open and your enemies are still engaging you. At that point, you cradle your primary weapon, still keeping the threat through the barrel towards the adversary. At that point, you extract the secondary weapon and present another weapon, which takes place of the primary, and primary goes into a sling up position, and you keep engaging with the secondary weapon. Russian weapons are, are known for their durability. They were designed for conscript troops, for third world guerrillas, so they're famous for operating under just abysmal conditions. One weapon would be as simple and deadly as they come. Mikhail Kalashnikov's AK-47 assault rifle is at the heart of Spetsnaz's weaponological family tree. Designed over 60 years ago, amazingly, it still forms the template for some of the deadliest weapons in today's Spetsnaz arsenal. Rewind to the 1970s. At the height of the Cold War, Soviet weapons designers would keep an eye on developments on the other side of the Iron Curtain to stay in the running during the arms race. They soon saw the deadly potential of the 5.56 millimeter caliber bullet being used by the American M16 rifle, which had fast become the main man in Vietnam. The Russians studied the M16 and the 5.56 round and decided to evolve their next AK series rifle into a rifle that fires a smaller cartridge. Once these smaller caliber bullets hit an enemy soldier, they were more likely to flip and tumble instead of passing straight through, tearing flesh and inflicting lethal damage. The sort of damage that could win battles. Russian designers wanted to marry off the deadly potential of a smaller 5.45 millimeter bullet to Kalashnikov's AK-47 designs. Step forward, the new and improved AK-74. Up until that point, the AK series of rifles had fired a larger 7.62 millimeter caliber bullet. The Russians evolved from the AK-47 and the 7.62x39 to the 5.45 AK-74, which is the standard and has been the standard in their army ever since. Notice, however, roughly the overall length is the same. That was critical for the Russians because it allowed them to essentially adapt the AK series of rifles to this new caliber without having to redesign the weapon internally dramatically. The AK-74's new 5.45 millimeter round would soon earn the nickname, the Poison Bullet. It was small, but deadly. Weaponology investigates. First up, the push through power of the AK-47's heavier 7.62 millimeter round. Here we go, going hot. Bullet strike, obviously right about right here. Actually separated the block. Second up, the slow, tumble and shred deadliness of the AK-74's 5.45 millimeter bullet. Okay, going hot. Okay, as you can see, the bullet entered here and actually impacted on the inside, did not penetrate through. Dramatic difference in the performance on a hardened object like cinder block or any other object along those lines. It might not look impressive, but the fact that the 5.45 millimeter bullet could not penetrate the block means increased battlefield effectiveness. While the AK-47's heavier 7.62 millimeter round would simply fly through a target, the AK-74's poison bullet tumbles, based first upon impact, slowing 
and creating enormous damage to any enemy soldier. 545 is meant for incapacitating people, not for penetrating through objects. The AK-74 would soon be put to the test in 1979. Russian special forces would lead the attack into Afghanistan. It would mark the beginning of a brutal 10-year war that would earn the label Russia's Vietnam. You start seeing the Soviet Union go from old traditional methods of fighting to learning how to fight in a modern battlefield almost overnight. Fighting a guerrilla war in the mountains, Spetsnaz would ensure that the AK-74 unleashing its new poison bullet would be deadly effective. Spetsnaz were very effective in combating the Mujahideen in the mountains of Afghanistan, and the Afghanis had a lot of respect for the gun, the cartridge, and the Spetsnaz who were using it. Since 1947, Kalashnikov's AK-47 design has developed and become even more deadly. 60 years on, and Spetsnaz rock and roll with the version of the AK that can literally bring the house down. This one is uh, one of the latest versions of uh, AK-74. It's AK-74M, collapsible stock. This is the ultimate AK. So this one is eye equipped with a red dot sight. There's two steel magazines with a magazine couplers to deploy the second magazine much quicker. And this weapon has extra killer bite, courtesy of an underslung grenade launcher. This is underbarrel grenade launcher GP30, uh, 40 millimeter. There's a sight for up to 400 meters. Uh, basically, it's very simple in use. Once the grenade is in, all they have to do is just to press the trigger. This deadly addition to the AK was loaded with grenades that caused massive carnage. This grenade is even more dangerous than any other one because this one is so-called uh, jumping grenade. We call it the bouncer because it does bounce and it explodes up in the air at about 100 to 150 centimeters up in the air. So just about your chest level, that's where it explodes. Are the underslung grenades as good as it gets? Don't bet on it. When Spetsnaz need to up the firepower, blasting down doors, or simply blasting away the enemy, they use a weapon system that is the deadly offspring of the AK-47 and a 12-gauge combat shotgun. Take cover. It's time to go semi-auto with a Saiga. What we have here is the Saiga 12-gauge shotgun. This is a semi-auto action, and this thing goes as fast as you can pull the trigger. Take a closer look. Kalashnikov has left his mark once again. It shoots identically to the AK, loads identically to the AK, uh, except in 12 gauge. If you look at it, I, I, nothing can go wrong with that. Just nothing. It's so simple. It's just because of an AK system, if you look at it. I mean, you can just go through like thousands of rounds of ammunition, and it will, will, it will work. It's a blast to shoot this weapon. <laughs> this person would have uh, had his head cleanly taken off or nothing left of his head. Pretty much this is the deadliness of a shotgun coupled with Russian engineering at its best. The snipers of Spetsnaz are experts at dealing out death at a distance. Find some cover, lower your heart rate, and gently squeeze that trigger as weaponology hunts the headshot with Spetsnaz's shooters. The Russians have not simply been good at sniping, but they've designed some really first-rate sniper rifles used by people like Spetsnaz. Their legacy of long-range covert kills goes back more than 60 years and features some of the most famous snipers and rifles in military history. Rewind to the 1940s and the standard service rifle of Soviet forces during World War II, the Mosin Nagant. 
The Mosin Nagant is a very important rifle because it was a rifle that was manufactured in numbers and volumes. 17 million rifles were made during the Second World War. First used by the Russians in 1891, the Mosin Nagant was adapted as a sniper rifle in 1932. It never messed up. It had a very powerful round, so it served the, the Russians very, very well. In weapons terms, it was a Russian revolution worth waving the red flags for. During the Battle of Stalingrad, its 7.62 millimeter heavy slug caused carnage. What we're gonna do now is load this heavy old slug into this Mosin-Nagant rifle and see what kind of impact it has on the pumpkin over there. This is definitely a kill shot. Small entrance hole, large exit hole. If this was an enemy German soldier, this person would have been lights out. The mosin nagant rifle was only as good as the soldier that pulled its trigger. One Soviet sniper, Vasily Zaitsev, armed with his faithful mosin nagant would wage a one-man war and kill over 240 Nazis. But it wasn't just the men of Mother Russia that took up arms against the Germans. One of the most predominant female snipers was Lyudmila Pavlichenko. She had over 300 kills credited to her, several of them being German snipers themselves. She was awarded the gold star to the hero of the Soviet Union, which helped her in the end become the legend that she was. <laughs> she says when she has a pistol in the hand, it is not advisable to get too close to her. The Mosin Nagant marked the beginning of a fine tradition of deadly sniper rifles. In 1963, the Soviets would take a revolutionary new step. They would design the world's first purpose-built sniper rifle, the Dragunov SVD. The Soviets have fielded the, this weapon for the latter half of the 20th century. It's a mass-produced, highly accurate semi-automatic rifle capable of engaging targets out to 800 or on the outside 1,000 meters. Amazingly, the legendary AK-47 assault rifle has left its mark on the design of this weapon as well. Much of this mass-produced gun's main features borrowed directly from Kalashnikov's designs. The selector switch for safe, semi-automatic only in this particular weapon, this is the same spot as an AK. Magazine releases in the same spot. Charging handle, it essentially loads and operates the same way as an AK. Weaponology investigates just how deadly the Dragunov is at a range of 250 yards. Let's go check it out. You can see why this weapon would be preferred and used extensively by the Spetsnaz. Very good weapon. In a lot of ways, you could argue the Western world has struggled to catch up with what this weapon brings to the table in the designated marksman role. Keep in mind, this is not a hand-built weapon, it's a factory-built weapon that they were able to issue thousands of. Look good, dead center hit, huh? Each Spetsnaz squad would have a Dragunov sniper expert dealing in long-distance death. It would be a job that would need a special sort of operative. One of the things that is considered very heavily in training is the psychological issues that you face. As a sniper looking through the optic, you're pretty much in a very small world, one-on-one -on -one with a person that you're gonna have to make decision about his life. And sometimes the right decision may not be the easiest decision to make. In the late 1980s, Soviet weapons designers would be given the task of developing an even deadlier new sniper rifle. At the time, Spetsnaz were making do using the AK-74 with silencers for stealthy infiltration. A new sniper's weapon was needed. The BSS would soon earn the nickname the Ventores, Russian for thread cutter, because of its legendary accuracy at a distance. It would soon become a firm favorite of Spetsnaz. What would make Ventores my weapon of choice would be its lethality and its silence. 
loaded with a subsonic 9mm round. This internally suppressed weapon keeps noise and flash to a minimum and can shoot through steel. I can take a 400 meter shot, very silent shot, to do what needs to be done, still having ammunition that penetrates any kind of military grade body armor without any problems. When terrorism's the disease, Spetsnaz sharpshooters are the cure. They would be tested to their absolute limits in September 2004, when terrorists from a Chechen separatist group took over 1,200 hostages prisoner at a school in Beslan. Herding their victims into a gym, they showed no mercy. These terrorists went off on an animalistic, feral rage, the likes of which no one inside that gym had ever seen. And the vast majority of them were, were women and children. One father tried to calm everybody, and they walked up and blew his brains out with an AK-47. They told the hostages, let this be a lesson to you. No one's going to save you. The terrorists rigged the gym with high explosives in anticipation of an attack from Spetsnaz. The siege reached a deadly stalemate, and for over two days, Beslan School Gym became a living hell. The terrorists had shot many of the older hostages. Spetsnaz were called in as the negotiator struggled for a deal. An attack was imminent. The, the Russians had gotten the terrorists to allow them to drive a truck in through the gates into that western yard and retrieve the bodies. At 105, just as they were picking up the first body, everybody heard a large explosion. The explosion signaled the start of a ferocious gun battle. And the terrorists had had days to fortify this. They had two belt-fed machine guns, tripwires, booby traps everywhere. The special forces units, once they gained entry into the school, they were being decimated. All three commanders of the Spetsnaz assault group would soon lie dead as casualties mounted. Some of the hostages tried to escape in the turmoil, under covering fire from Spetsnaz's sharpshooting snipers. They started engaging right away, trying to, to keep the terrorists out of the windows, trying to give the hostages a chance to, to get across the yards to safety. One innocent victim's plight would be photographed during this ferocious battle. Seven-year-old Aida Sidakova would soon present Spetsnaz with a heartbreaking moral dilemma. They thought this little girl was dead. And after a while, this child began to stir. Um, and she stood up, and she was standing along the, the side of the wall. The Russian snipers were terrified. If this child took one step, that she was going to be shot down. And one young Russian sniper was screaming into his headset begging for permission to, to shoot this child in a leg, hoping that he could drop her and, and at least save her life. He's got to make a decision to deliver a bullet across a yard that he knows is going to completely shatter a little girl's leg because he realizes it's the only way to keep her alive. But chaos and confusion would reign. The decision was soon taken away from the sniper. And as with everything from the Russian command during the, the Beslan battle, that, that permission came too late. This little girl with one last look around her tortured mind, knowing nothing else than to seek the, the comfort of her fellow hostages, climbed through the window back into the gym. And within a couple minutes of that, the rest of the ceiling had collapsed and the gym was engulfed in flames. Miraculously, Aida would survive the fire, and over 850 civilians would escape with their lives. But 334 people, including over 186 children, were killed. It was a no-win situation for Russia's elite. Hostages are going to die, and all the men of these units can do is try to keep as many of them alive as possible. And, and sadly, it, it becomes a numbers game.
Russia Spetsnaz, hard as steel, honed for the kill. Their most deadly weapon in an arsenal designed to eradicate the enemy? The Spetsnaz warrior himself. They are men of steel, forged from the most brutal training program in the world. They go through a brutal selection process that would never be tolerated in the United States. It would be seen as too grossly inhuman. They lose so many of their own in training because they are pushed to such extreme levels. После подготовки, вот специальной подготовки, любой спецназовец, любой боец, в принципе, может для него безразлично, есть у него оружие или нет. То есть он как бы сам является оружием. At the core of all training was physical exercise and immersion into a world of pain. They can take more punishment and more pain than you can possibly dish out. And with that, it's amazing to watch them undergo just the, the brutality of their training. You have to have absolute comfort with pain, and it is a tool the Russians take into battle with because their training is so tough, it is so brutal, and there are no pads, and there are no mouthpieces. Each Spetsnaz trainee is taken to hell and back using techniques designed to break a man down and prepare him mentally for the horrors of war. A lot of people say, you know, in combat, under stress, I'm going to rise up to the occasion. You never do. You fall down to the lowest level of your training. And if you haven't been pushed to the level where you hit the bottom in training, it's overwhelming panic. And if you have been trained that way, not to say that you're still going to survive and win, but you're going to make training-based decisions when, so to speak, there's nowhere else to go but up. Both the body and the mind are pushed to the absolute limits. There were training segments where you would be brought in for, I guess, what you can describe as a questioning. In front of a number of nurses, you were stripped naked. And you were pushed to the limits where morally and in some other ways, most people would just either break down or start fighting. Part of that training was to see your ability to remain the equilibrium, the balance, the stability, to still make rational decisions instead of giving in to emotional responses based on anger and fear. The cornerstone of all Spetsnaz training has been a baptism into the brutality of close quarters combat. One weapon that Spetsnaz really dig is their Sapirka shovel. Что можно я делать? Только копать, да. Но с другой стороны, здесь очень много функций у этой лопаты. Ей можно просто использовать как нож. Ее можно использовать как метательное оружие. Кроме того, данная лопата имеет рычаги. Этими рычагами можно управлять противником, то есть использовать его в качестве щита для защиты от ножа или от пули. И учитывая толщину стали, в принципе, если дать касательную, то можно и увести, так сказать, пулю от прямого попадания. The shovel compared to a knife has a much greater weight to it makes it a much more effective throwing weapon. It's going to do damage wherever it hits, and ideally, it'll hit a, a vital area of the body. So certainly you can see from the shovels in the wood here, and this is very hard wood, the depth at which these have gone into that. So that's clearly something that would cut the flesh easily. It would cut through bone, break bones, destroy whatever it's going to hit. Even if this deadly tool is taken off a Spetsnaz warrior, hand-to-hand -hand combat with his enemy is still within this warrior's comfort zone. They realize that hand-to-hand -hand combat is brutal, and it is ugly, and it is fast. And you've got to be able to bring to bear the best of the brutal and ugly techniques and skills that you have, or you're going to die. 
At the heart of Russian hand-to-hand -hand combat are three main fighting systems. First up, Rukopashny Boy. Designed to destroy a man in combat, it is about hard, aggressive strikes and blows where the fighter stays mostly on his feet. Igor is going to be demonstrating Rukopashny Boy, and again, recognizing that the trademarks of that are very fast, very violent, brutal, practical moves that usually are going to look to end with your opponent on the ground, usually finishing with, with a quick hand strike to the throat. The second system is Sambo. With its roots in wrestling and grappling on the ground, the Spetsnaz fighter utilizes throws, locks, and holds to disable their enemy. Mike's gonna do a quick high speed spiraling downward spin into the ground. Um, often when, when done well, you're gonna impact your opponent, his ribs on one side, you striking his ribs on the other. Often you can, you can affect a, a separation of cartilage in the ribs just on contact. He will go into a, a laid back arm lock, which would result in the complete dislocation or shattering of his opponent's elbow. The third and final system has revolutionized hand-to-hand -hand combat. It is called Sistema. Based on principles of balance, breathing, and natural movement, it is deadly effective on the battlefield. The Sistema specialists really are masters, sometimes artists, and their ability to move so many parts of their body using relaxation, more fluidity, greater range of motion, and all those other body parts. One of the aspects of Sistema always being to move your feet, breathe, and relax. Scooping that elbow and, and pinning the attacking wrist, Tom will continue to just pivot around that arm with no more effort than just the movement of the feet at that point. We'll put Andre on the ground in front of him. Unknown to much of the Western world until the 1990s, Sistema has created a real buzz amongst the elite forces community. The fighting techniques and the spirit of Spetsnaz are respected around the globe. I guess it can be summed up where you develop a man into a weapon. I've been trained to do it with a knife. I've been trained to do it by throwing a shovel or by any other means, be it creating some kind of a cocktail for a person to drink or doing any kind of chemical magic. It, it all adds up into, into creating what became somewhat of a legend of Spetsnaz. The legend lives on. There's a very old Russian saying, hundreds of years old, that the Russian has a very broad back. And by that, they mean that they can withstand anything. And you see that very national mentality, that cultural identity, transferred directly to their special forces because I see those men tolerate far more than, than you would see in the vast majority of nations, most elite units. Drawn together, the branches on the Spetsnaz family tree reflect their unique genesis. From the war in Afghanistan to the siege in Beslan, they have evolved into the Kremlin's deadliest fighting force. At their heart, the AK-47, an assault rifle that would shape history. Armed with cutting-edge weapon systems like the Venturez sniper rifle and some of the deadliest unarmed combat moves known to man. They are Mother Russia's elite killers. They are Spetsnaz.